I'm walking down from Nonstein Castle in Laubstuhl, Germany, where I'm shooting video footage for my other channel, which is called The Traveling Historian, where I'm just kind of documenting my travels across the world and talking about history and things like that. Well, I have like a 20 minute walk back down to the train station in Laubstuhl, and there's no one around. So I thought I'd go ahead and spend this time and record a video talking about, naturally, semantic searching. So what is semantic searching? Semantic searching is when we're able to take the semantics or the, the meaning meaning of a user's inquiry or query in a search engine, but instead of using that to find keywords in a collection of documents that might sit in a database, instead what we're doing is we're trying to capture the essence of that query and then return results that might not necessarily have the same keywords, but rather have the same essence as that query. So what's a good example of this? Well, let's imagine I was searching across documents related to the Holocaust. And this is a real use case that I have done in the past. And imagine you wanted to maybe search for and find any documents that dealt with the concept of hunger. This was a real research case with a real researcher at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum a few years ago. How would you search for that if you were using keywords? Well, one thing you could do is you could come up with a list of keywords and synonyms to the word hunger. So maybe things like hungry, starve, starvation. And you get good results. You could find documents that have those keywords in there absolutely in a, in a database that's been indexed. The problem is, is that hunger can be expressed in a lot of different ways. It's an abstract concept and it can be expressed without using the explicit word hunger or its, you know, identifiable synonyms. So what does this mean? Well, it means in Holocaust uh, oral testimonies, for example, a person might talk about hunger but not use that specific word. Instead, they might say the expression, we were uh, in need of food, we didn't have enough bread. Now, in that sentence, I've expressed a very clear concept, the abstract idea of hunger, meaning hunger is implied to be the next step in my situation. The thing that I didn't do, though, was I didn't use the word hunger or any of its synonyms. Now, if I needed to find that document and I were to search for maybe just the keyword hunger, I probably wouldn't actually find it. And the reason for that is because it doesn't have the explicit word hunger. And this gets to the point and the backbone of semantic searching. Semantic searching would allow for us to vectorize or convert that query of hunger into the essentially the, the mathematical meaning of that concept of hunger. And then what we can do is we can use that vector and see how it compares to the vectors of all other documents in our database rather than keywords. And that means that we could find things that dealt with the abstract idea of hunger, such as the sentence I just said, and other documents that used that explicit word of hunger or maybe synonyms like starve or starvation. So what does this mean? It really means that with one single search, I'm able to find and retrieve documents that either have that keyword or have the meaning of that keyword. So what's a good way to think about this as an analogy? The one I like to use is to think about being a historian and walking through a library. Now imagine you're looking for a very specific book. How are you gonna find that book in a library? You're probably gonna go up to the computer, you're gonna type in the title of that book, then you're gonna to go to the section of the library where that book is, and you're gonna find it and you're gonna grab it. That would be more of your traditional keyword searching. In the example of a library though, vector or semantic based searching is a little different. Imagine you're in that same situation and you're not looking for maybe one book, you're looking for a bunch of books that are similar. Now, if you're a historian, by training, you probably already know what to do. You're gonna go, you're gonna find that book that you're looking for, and the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna peruse and look at the books that appear around it on the bookshelf. Because very likely, they're gonna be similar to the one that you've just grabbed, and they're gonna be ones that are also interesting. This is the concept of semantic searching, finding the things that you didn't know existed by searching for something that is similar to a query. So that's semantic searching in a nutshell. So the big question is, does semantic search replace keyword searching? And the answer is no. They should be used as two different tools to solve two different problems. Keyword searching is really good when you know the keywords that you want to search for. Semantic search is good when you don't. Now, there are approaches that can make the best of both of these worlds, and this is called a hybrid approach. 
Now, if you want to get familiar with semantic searching, it's probably going to be necessary for you to learn Python. But if you want to just learn about it by using it, then I've got a couple good links in the description down below where you can find semantic search engines that I've built for a couple different digital humanities projects, including one that lets you semantically query a collection of about a thousand Holocaust testimonies, and another one that lets you semantically query Shakespeare's entire corpus. If you do have Python, though, and you're looking to maybe up your game with a couple different Python packages, then here's the ones that I would recommend in order of easiness uh, to more advanced. The first one's going to be Text AI. Out of the box, it's let you build a semantic search engine. It handles all the heavy lifting for you automatically. The next one is going to be requiring you to build out a couple different components of semantic searching, one being the index or the vector database, and the other being the way in which you kind of vectorize everything and the way in which you query everything. So each of these different stages are going to be handled by two different Python packages. One is going to be probably transformers that's going to allow you to load up a machine learning model to vectorize your texts. Uh, I'll have a link in the description down below for the models that I would recommend for uh, English and multiple languages. And the other thing is going to be the algorithm and the vector database for querying that vector database. This is going to be a NOI from Spotify, which is, in my opinion, one of the better and easier implementations of semantic querying in Python. When I'm working on a project, personally, the first thing that I do is this approach number two, because it's typically very easy to get up and running, and you can really use the same uh, template for a lot of different projects by simply changing out the model. The third option, the most sophisticated in my opinion, is to start working with APIs. Now these are going to be better uh, for more finalized projects, and they're going to be the things that you would put into production. Uh, one of the best libraries for doing this is going to be hands down Weaviate. There are a bunch of different libraries out there like Pinecone. I happen to like Weaviate because of the way in which you can query, the fact that it's open source, and the fact that it has very good documentation and a team that is very pro open source. All these things make me really love Weavy8. Weavy8 is a vector database that lets you automatically uh, vectorize, build out, and also even query or semantically search across all of those documents. So it'll handle essentially everything for you. The reason why it's more advanced is because it requires you to build out an independent server that can host all those documents. And this is known as your Weavy8 server. And then it requires you to set up an API key to then query that server. Now these require a couple more steps and are a little bit more advanced, but what you get is a lot of flexibility and something that can be put into production because the server handles all the heavy load for you rather than having to load everything up locally. And when you start building out more formal projects, especially ones that are larger, these are very important features that Weavy8 gives you. I'm gonna go get some chocolate croissants from Aldi Soup before my train ride, but if you like this video, like and subscribe and consider buying me a coffee down below.